we have a whole bunch of things to talk about on the list. But first, just before I forget, because, you know, as the years go by, the brain ain't what it used to be, unfortunately. You know, it's funny, as we get older, I feel definitely wiser than I've ever been. But memory and different things, hey, they're not as good. By the way, you see that cute dog? I'm just going to turn the screen down the camera and show you. There she is. She's not on camera that much, so. <laughs> and if you're going on the cruise, you'll see her there. Anyway, back to business here. But yeah, wisdom with age, definitely you get a lot of that. And that's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. But memory and things like that, eh, not as good <laughs> as they used to be. So before I forget, what was I thinking? Oh, yeah. Before I forget, I want to make sure that I mention to you something extremely important, extremely important. And what is that? Oh, the dog is leaving me. See, as soon as I start talking, she leaves. <laughs> Just like most women. <laughs> anyway, so what do I want to share with you before I forget? That is this. For those of you clients or prospective clients... It is incredibly important that you stay in touch with us. You could lose a lot of money and have a lot of hassles if you do not stay in touch with us. Why? Well, one of many reasons, uh, I mean, besides all the normal stuff we do, is to understand and keep informed about the changing pulse of various markets various situations, not the least of which is our relationships with our various team members. Folks, I have told you before that our local market specialists, we treasure them and they treasure us. And that's all great in the beginning. But as time goes on, cracks start to appear and we start to sense that not all of them are doing the right thing. And some of them are doing very wrong things <laughs> from time to time. Some of them are doing unethical and illegal things, in my humble opinion. Well, unethical, easier opinion than legal. I'm not a lawyer. Anyway, the point is keep in touch with us so that you don't get burned, so we can guide you. Because some of these relationships, we just end them. I mean, they're just bad, some of these people, right? They just, they seem great at first, and then you get into it. It's kind of like, you know, dating in the early stages. Hopefully that stage lasts, that euphoria, right? That first three months, hopefully it lasts. And a lot of times in these relationships, it does last for years and years and years. But sometimes, even after several years, the relationships, they change. And we don't want to recommend these people anymore. And we have had over and over again, you know, we made a referral to someone and then a couple of years later, you'll reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm working with him. And then we say, well, guess what? We're not working with him anymore. And you got all sorts of complaints and you want us to help you with them. And we don't have the kind of leverage we used to have with that provider. So this is very important. Just keep in touch. You can totally solve the problem by just keeping in touch with your investment counselor and we'll be happy to help you. Okay, so I've got several things here that are kind of random, but they kind of tie together. And I think you'll find these to be very, very valuable. First off is this article. Half of American households are struggling to cover rising housing costs. And folks, I know we are definitely hearing a lot of doom and gloom out there. And I'm going to explain what is really happening here? The subtitle, some respondents reported skipping meals, working extra hours, or even delaying necessary medical treatments to make their housing costs, to pay their housing costs. And folks, it is true. There are many people in America who are struggling. No question about that. Now, compared to what? Well, I think there is this kind of mentality in the American psyche that really, even if you weren't alive then, it harkens back to the period between maybe 1950 and 1970. And then it took a breather because in the 70s, we had a pretty weird, challenging economy in a lot of ways. 
went off the gold standard in 71 on August 15th. And then we suffered a lot of inflation in the 70s. But then by the early 80s, we moved into the Reagan revolution. And economic times were pretty good for a lot of people in the 80s. And then in the 90s, you know, the internet came along and that like revolutionized so many things and so on and so forth. But what A lot of these things have done, whether they be government fiscal policy or Federal Reserve, central bank monetary policy, and I'm not just talking about the U.S., I'm talking about around the world too, or technology or cultural changes, societal changes, whatever, right? A lot of these things really led to sort of an overriding thing, and that is this, a greater dichotomy and a greater divide in wealth concentration and the digital divide in technology, not not really like access to technology, but people using technology in a way that benefits them economically, right? There's a divide there. I mean, most people are using technology now, right? The, you know, the smartphone really changed all that. The idea of apps that were much simpler. I mean, in the old days, depending on how old you are listening or watching this, I remember going to classes to learn how to use my computer. Can you imagine going to classes today? The software has become so much easier to use that hardly anyone takes a class to figure out how to use their computer anymore, right? They just start using it, right? And that changed a lot with apps. And, you know, it changed a lot with uh, WYSIWYG and Windows even back then and, you know, the graphical user interface, if you want to go way back, the GUI. But The divide is not that people use technology, because almost everybody's using technology. I mean, homeless people have iPhones nowadays. We all know this, right? But it's using technology to benefit them economically. And there is a divide there. People who own businesses or people who are in the managerial elite class that, by the way, is being hollowed out. So be careful. Be ready for that. Secure your own financial future with the most historically proven asset class in world history, and that is income property. Okay, <laughs> little little plug there. So those people use technology and it benefits them economically. A lot of people use technology like drones, like pacified drones, right? Looking at TikTok or other social media all day and just kind of consuming stuff that doesn't make them any money. They're basically helping other people make money. So don't be in that class to whatever extent possible. I mean, everybody needs a little entertainment. But the point is, we have a bifurcated economy. And this is something that the doom and gloomers get so wrong. And I'm going to show you a chart here in a couple minutes that really, I think, explains a lot of this issue when it comes especially to the housing market. Because they look at an article like this and they'll say, well, look, half of all Americans are struggling to cover their housing costs. I don't deny that. That is completely true. I know people who are struggling. I certainly know of people who are struggling. And I certainly do a lot of reading and research about people struggling. And I think it's terrible. The middle class is being hollowed out and people are either moving up or they're moving down. And back in 2004, when I got into the investor-only business, that was one of my big missions, to end middle-class poverty and to help people, to whatever extent possible, not be in that group that was under attack. I remember reading Lou Dobbs' book, which I've quoted often, great book, by the way, from over 20 years ago. It's called War on the Middle Class, Highly recommend that you read it, especially chapter two in Lou Dobbs' book, War on the Middle Class. So that middle class is being hollowed out and it's pushing people down. And some people, the lucky few, are moving up. And my goal 20 years ago was to help as many people move up and not be hollowed out in that attack on the middle class, that war on the middle class. And I think I've done a pretty good job of that. You know, we've helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people not be victims of this attack on the middle class. But when you see these articles and you hear about the people that don't have enough money to meet a $1,000 emergency expense or a $400 emergency expense or whatever it is, that's true. And when you read about these rising credit card debt levels and auto debt levels and student loan debt, all of this is there. It is a real, real thing. But there's a big thing they're not 
telling you when you read this stuff. And it's easy to become suckered in to thinking, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. Chicken little, the sky is falling. The world is coming to an end. We're all doomed, right? Well, no. The reason is we are in a highly bifurcated economy that is bifurcating more and more. You know, Robert Frost said, two paths diverged in the wood and I took the one less traveled and that has made all the difference. And, you know, a lot of times people can't really control the path they're on. They get controlled by somebody else. And I remember many years ago at age 17, when one of my great mentors, Jim Rohn, said, if you don't have a plan for your life, you will by default be part of somebody else's plan. And you don't wanna be in that position, obviously. So if you're watching on video, look at this chart. This is from Parcel Labs, and it shows the percentage of home purchases made all cash. These are all cash home purchases each quarter for the last couple of years. I mean, right now, we are sitting at a time when 33.5% of home buyers is paying all cash. Now, that, ladies and gentlemen, is not the same as paying all cash many years ago in the 50s or the 60s when houses were much cheaper and the income to home price ratio was much better, right? You know, you could afford a home with like two times your annual income back then. Now you need what? You know, seven, eight. 10 times your annual income, which by the way, that may sound really bad, but what caused that, right? Well, the first thing is to understand what caused it. Well, that is the widespread availability of super cheap, long-term fixed rate mortgage debt. That made that all possible. So making the comparison to decades ago, how much cheaper homes were as a percentage of income is not valid because the game changed right? You know, we didn't have this long-term 30-year fixed rate debt back then. And, and I know you might be thinking, well, Jason, that sucks. Are we ever going to own anything? Klaus Schwab said you'll own nothing and you'll be happy from the World Economic Forum in Davos, right? Well, yeah, sort of. Really, he was talking about the sharing economy when he said that, okay? <laughs> so that's the first thing. But this diabolical plan, I mean, what do you think is really different, right? With all of these people out there selling their fear porn and, you know, the chicken little crowd, the sky is falling, the doomers, right? All of them talking to you about Klaus Schwab and the WEF, World Economic Forum, and all of these other elite people trying to take advantage of us, right? Well, sure, it's true. They are trying to take advantage of us. Show me a time in history when the ruling class did not subjugate the ruled class. I'm waiting. Oh, crickets. The silence is deafening. This is the way it is. I mean, get over it. What do you expect? Do you expect Klaus Schwab and Bill Gates and all of these other elites to like give you all their money or, you know, not want more control and influence? Of course not. That's just human nature. And, you know, some of them are more evil than others. Sure, absolutely. But this is the way it has always been. Not saying it's good. It's just the way of life. It's the way of the world. I mean, if you think human nature is different today, just go back and read scripture. And you can see that people were exactly the same 2,500 years ago as they are today. Right? They're really human nature has not changed. And we have long recorded history of that back at least 2,500 years. And it's right in the, what, the 64 books of the Bible, okay? So just read it, see it, it's all there, right? People are the same they've always been. They're controlling, they're selfish, they do bad things. This is just, everybody's out for themselves. Grow up, get over it, okay? Like, you know, I, I remember when I was a kid, you know, not understanding how the world works. I remember someone told me, Jason, don't be one of the, those people who, who thinks the world owes you a living. Nobody owes you anything. You gotta make it for yourself, right? And, you know, that kind of hit me. It influenced me, that comment from my neighbor who said that when I lived in Los Angeles. So here we have 33% of people paying all cash for expensive homes. This shows you that we are in a bifurcated world. 
and it's getting bigger. That that gap between the haves and the have-nots is widening. But by the same token, it does not mean that the have-nots aren't better off than they've been at many times throughout history. Now, what do I always say? Watch old movies, read old books, listen to old music, watch old TV shows. Now, with some of these things, we can't go back very far, right? Because for old movies, we can really only go back to, uh, I don't know, the 30s, right? When you had the talkies. (laughs) Well, you can go back further than that. What is that one really famous really interesting movie that's a silent movie, but it's still famous and people still watch it. I've watched it, you know, where just kind of as a commentary on how society's all mechanized and everybody's a drone just going to do their little job. And uh, it's a very artsy movie. I can't remember what it's called, but some of you know what I'm talking about. So the poor, the people that are being taken advantage of by the elite class, by the banksters, by Wall Street, by all of these politicians and so forth, right? They are still a lot better off than they have been throughout most of history, okay? The poor now have smartphones. They have a place to live, most of them. They have a car, most of them. I mean, folks, just go back and watch old TV shows and old movies and look at life, you know, like read The Grapes of Wrath, right? I've talked about that book many times in the post-pandemic world, how we were, you know, seeing a new big American migration that was the biggest since The Grapes of Wrath, the John Steinbeck era, right? During the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl, when everybody moved, right? The whole country, it seems like, moved. And we had that post-pandemic, just as I predicted, right? I predicted that would happen. And as soon as those lockdowns lifted, everybody moved. And it was exactly as I predicted, right? No one else in the media was predicting that, except yours truly, at least not that I know of. Okay, so we got all these people paying cash. We have a bifurcated world. That's the way it is. Let's do what we can to help save the middle class because the middle class is a really important thing for society. And by the way, just because I'm reporting on this, don't kill the messenger. It doesn't mean I agree with it. It just means I'm explaining the world as I see it. The world according to Jason. Okay, so... A lot of people paying cash. This is the second best time in terms of cash buyers. The best time was Q1 of 2023 when 36% of all home buyers were paying cash. At any other time on this chart, there haven't been as many cash buyers as there are today. So that's one thing to think about. A lot of people have a lot of money. By the way, I just had to share my Eclipse picture with you. This picture was taken on an iPhone in front of my house, right in front of my house in the street. And it's pretty good for an eclipse picture. If you were watching on video, you can see what I'm talking about here. Not bad for you know a camera phone. Okay, now this is more part of the crisis. And this one really depressed me when I read this the other day. Rural America is losing affordable housing at a crisis pace. Efforts are afoot to reform a key USDA program. By the way, did you all know that USDA, yeah, you think they stamp the thing on your your side of beef? Well, they also make home loans, the USDA. (laughs) What government agency doesn't make home loans, right? So the USDA home loan program now subsidizing housing for hundreds of thousands of poor rural tenants. The article goes on to say the lack of affordable housing in the United States is well documented in the nation's urban markets, where it is contributing to swelling ranks of the homeless. That some dire need for affordable housing for the least prosperous among us, however, is also a serious problem in rural America, home to nearly 70 million Americans compared to what? There's about 339 million Americans right now, I think. And so 70 million in rural America, and there is a homelessness crisis. Now, did you know about this? I never thought much about it. I didn't know it was this severe. So again, the bifurcated world in which we live. Now, why am I telling you all this? What is the point? My point is that when you're thinking, well, gosh, you know, all this bad news, will my real estate go down in value? Well, we've talked about that extensively, and I'm going to go over a couple of inventory statistics you haven't heard before in just a moment here. Really important, so stick with me. You got to understand that your buyer 
and probably your tenant is not in the class of all of the bad news you hear. That's not your customer, right? That is a whole other part of the economy. And it shouldn't be. It's terrible that it is bifurcated like this. I'm just reporting on it. it I, I think it's bad for society. I think it bodes poorly for the stability of the country. When you have the haves and have nots, you have a much greater propensity towards civil unrest, right? And that's coming to a neighborhood near you. We've all, we already saw a lot of it in the wake of George Floyd, which was just silly and ridiculous, but you know, it is what it is, right? And we're going to have more of it. It's just the reality. When eventually the peasants, they get the pitchforks and they come out and they cause problems and they, they're angry and that's the way it is. I mean, look at all the austerity measure riots in Europe over the past 15 years, uh, starting with Greece specifically. I mean, they're just all over the place, right? Many rural communities, USDA Section 515 properties are among the few sources of affordable rental housing. So I'm sure the government will basically turn on the printing press and you know support this program it'll get the attention it needs but the point is bifurcated america so this is the hidden homelessness epidemic that is out there that most people don't really see because they see it in los angeles they see it in new york they see it in san francisco but they don't see it in rural america all right let's look at some housing inventory this is important so weekly inventory fell. Inventory is going down. Okay. It went down uh, slightly from 517,000 and I'm rounding off here to 512,000. Okay. The same week last year, the compared to what question we had 410,000 to 411,000 last year at this time, the same week, the all time bottom we've reported on many times was about 240,000 homes for sale in the United States. Remember that's out of what compared to what the overall housing stock of about 140 million units very very low the inventory peak last year was 570,000 homes so right now we are about 60,000 homes below the peak last year all right there's a good really good comparison for you for some context though let's go back to 2015 Get in the time machine and go back to 2015, where we had over 1 million homes for sale in 2015. Now, look, I was in this business in 2015, and 2015 was a good year. That wasn't a disaster. It wasn't a buyer's market. Sellers were still calling the shots, and I was still complaining back then about the lack of inventory. And by the way, yesterday I interviewed Mike Simonson on the show again, and we'll publish that interview maybe next week or the week after. But one of the things I said to him is I said, you know, your stats are great, but they need to be adjusted for the size of the marketplace. In other words, for population and compared to the number of housing units, right? Just like we adjust things on a per capita basis, same concept. Because if you go back to 2015, and you think, okay, well, just over 1 million homes for sale, and you compare that to today where we've only got 512,000 homes for sale, right? You think, okay, well, we have half. Yeah, but not really. We have less than that. Why? Because the population is higher than it was then, and the number of overall housing units in the housing stock, which now stands at around 140 million, was lower back then. So comparatively, there are even fewer homes on the market than half of what we had in 2015. Just understand that. It's not a tremendous difference, but it is a difference. When you go back that far, it is a difference, okay? So hopefully that gives you some context. This article I thought was interesting. It's from Business Insider. Home prices are poised to jump another 5% this year as the market is even tighter than it was in 2023, Economist says, okay? And this article was from yesterday. Home prices could see another 5% surge this year. Capital Economist predicted the research firm pointed to home inventory levels, which are still near historic lows. Low inventory has helped push home prices higher over the last year as demand remains hot. 
So much for the crash, bros, folks. Show me some data. If you're going to comment below, if you're watching on YouTube and you're going to comment and give me some idiotic hit and run statement about, well, Jason, the market's going to crash. Well, then provide some fucking data, please. Give me some data. Like, let's chew on it, right? Give me some data, crash bros, because you just don't have any, except those articles about rural homelessness. And that just shows there's a housing shortage. We need to build more homes. Okay. Or that other article about emergency expenses and all that stuff. Yes, it's all true, but it's a bifurcated economy. Those people aren't buying your house. They're not renting your house. That's not your customer. It's not your market, right? It's terrible, but it's not your customer. It's not your market. Now, we also need to talk about this. So look, we've got this situation where we have this massive housing shortage. It's a really tough housing market. But then we have to ask ourselves, well, look, baby boomers are going to start dying off, right? They are. There's no question about it. It's just a matter of actuarial tables, right? Ask anybody in the life insurance business, and it's going to happen as sure as day. Okay, so true. Now, this chart from John Burns Real Estate is interesting because what it does is it projects that out into the future. How much impact will this have on the housing market? So it says societal shifts, listings from aging baby boomers are not a silver tsunami. Aging baby boomers are adding few homes to the resale market supply. Not that many. People keep saying, well, this is what's going to cause the crash. <laughs> we'll see. Not an overblown, quote, silver tsunami, unquote. The number of homes listed for sale due to aging baby boomers is increasing, but gradually. And the chart shows you that right now, this is adding about 700,000 homes to the market every year. Interestingly, back in 2021, it added a little more than that to the market, right? Now, they don't have to die to put their home on the market. They just have to downsize or move into assisted living or something like that, right? So the fact is, this is a source of supply for more resale homes that could hit the market. But how big is the source? Well, by 2033, right, almost 10 years away, by 2033, and this is just math, folks, it's actuarial tables, it's really easy to predict, you know, there's not going to be a lot of change to this, there might be a little bit around the edges, maybe longevity sciences get a lot better, people live longer, they live healthier, I don't know, with our poison food supply in America, probably not, but you know, that's a different discussion. So by then, almost 10 years from now, they say this will add about 770,000 homes will be added to the market. 10 years from now, that'll be the number, right? In 2033, that's projected, of course. And right now, we're at just about 700,000 a year added to the market. So about 70,000 more homes will be added to the market almost 10 years from now. <laughs> that doesn't create a housing crash. And I know we're projecting out pretty far here, but the chart is even lower than that for the years leading up to it. So. This is not your housing crash, folks. Baby boomer deaths will lead to 772,000 homes listed for sale annually by 2033. Oh, that's what I just tried to read on the graph. So 772, I was pretty close. A big number, but less than 1% of all owner-occupied homes. Not all homes will be for sale, as many will transition to single-family rental units. So again, even if they transition to rentals, would it crash the rental market? No. If they transition to sales, would it crash the for sale market? Not even close. And I've talked about shadow demand. So this is shadow supply, right? This is the opposite side of the equation, which I saw your comments, folks. A lot of you said, well, Jason, what about the shadow supply? Okay, here it is. All right, everybody. So that's it for today. Thank you for listening. Be empowered investors in the marketplace with all the greatest knowledge. Reach out to us through jasonhartman.com and we're happy to help you with anything and everything. We have our Wednesday meeting every single month that happens to be today. By the time you hear this, it'll probably already have happened where we're talking about lease options and turning your tenants into option buyers and rent home programs. That's going to be really good. And we have our Empowered Investor Pro meeting the first Tuesday of every month. 
Our cruise is coming up. For those of you going on the cruise, we'll look forward to seeing you on the 27th on Celebrity Cruises. That's going to be great. And we will also see all the rest of you on the next episode. Happy investing. Until then. 